Um, we're in the last session of Thessalonians, and we're finishing up our spring um, study, and we're heading into the summer. And the challenge for next week as we leave the New Testament and go into the Old Testament is to understand God's word and his rele relevance today. God's word is relevant today. Relevant holistically to the church. And we know sometimes we think of the church as a building or sometimes we think of a church as this thing that we attend. But honestly, we're the church. We're the bride of Christ. We want this to be relevant to us. And God's word, when we think of God's word, it's a special communication to us. It's a communication to the corporate body of the church, but it's also his direct communication to us. And the instance of Thessalonians, it's a communication of Paul to his beloved friends. And you know, we should take this as a personal experience for each of us when we encounter God's word. This is communication that God is talking to our hearts. Um, you should approach God's word like you approach when you pray. You know, it's a personal, intimate relationship that you have and this opportunity for God to speak to you. And we have that in so many different ways. Um, God's communication, how do we protect that? And what other kinds of communication do we have with God? What resonates with us? Um, how many of you, if, if you want to acknowledge it, uh, had a chance to see Fernando Ortega when he came here? So, um, I had not experienced him before. So if you've never experienced Fernando Ortega, uh, do a Google search on him on YouTube and listen to one of his songs. Um, I was introduced to a song that wasn't part of my childhood called Give Me Jesus. And the lyrics of that song, Give Me Jesus, are so simple. And when he sings them, so sweet. It's in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Yes. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Just give me Jesus. Hmm. This is communication from Fernando and worship to God, but it's also communication from God to us of this intimate relationship and music stirs that up in me. And um, that music was actually uh, pulled from Matthew 16, 26. And I didn't know the story of that music, but in 1845, it was published in something called the Evangelical Heart. And it was published by the Reverend Jacob Knapp. And I thought that was interesting because he was a Baptist minister out of New York. So I think good things come from Baptists. And since I'm a new Baptist, this is kind of fun to read about these things. It's also uh, called the song, Give Me Jesus, and I heard the mourner say, so it might be interesting to explore the history of that song and find its tradition in our country. So I challenge you to that. You know, the Jews had a hymnal, had a song book. The Jews called it the Book of Praises. And in the Septuagint, in Greek, we call it the Book of Psalms. You realize that Psalms is a song book. It's a hymnal. It's 150 songs that were written. And I touch on this. These songs that were written by David and Solomon, the sons of Korah, Asaph, Hema, and Ethan, and Moses, because this is communication from God's word in song to God. But we know that God's word is alive and powerful and breathed to us. It's God's word back to us, too. So it really stirs our heart. And I think of that also in the context of this letter of Thessalonica, the letter to the Thessalonians that we're going to study. I want to read to you this song that was written by David, Psalm 19, a portion of it, 7 through 10. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord is true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So these are our instructions in song and in verse and in letters of how we understand to personalize God, God's intent for us. This is how when we leave somewhat the formalized gathering of Sunday school or church, our forward operating base, we're in a forward operating base. We're an outpost of heaven in enemy territory. How do we prepare ourselves in enemy territory, this church, to go out into the world that's hostile towards us and live as Christians? Well, you only do that by studying God's word and putting it in your heart. 
and acting as Christians. And how do we find out about that? Well, we have to study God's word. To be salt, to be light, to love God, and yes, to love your neighbor. John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And we demonstrate that by being the hands and feet of Christ in the community that we live in. So the last time I had an opportunity to teach, I think I used an example of some letters because I wanted to show the personalization of the letters from Paul to the Thessalonians. It was a personal letter because he had built a relationship with somebody, not unlike building a relationship with trusted believers in his class. These were his friends, his cherished friends, his friends who would suffer on this side of eternity, but friends that he would someday see in heaven again. And I'm new, only been here a year developing relationships with you. But how many of you will I see again in heaven? Perfectly. What a wonderful thought. And so in the tradition that I started, I wrote a couple letters. I wrote a special letter to Roy and Judy. Because I love you. And I would want you to receive that, not in like how the congregation in Thessalonica or Thessalonica would receive a letter from Paul. It'd be something that would be sweet and cherishable, especially if I wrote it nice, but then imagine his word is inspired by God. I hope I hope mine shows some of that as well. Uh, Dudley and Renee, I love you guys. I knew Sherry was going to be here because Kevin told me. So we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll write a letter to each of you if I, if I had the time to. Um, and, and you truly are friends of mine that care about you, but bring your mouth and love. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I saw the <laughs> 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 nice. Last Sunday, I was just trying to talk to my glory. So. So. God's word. I love the scripture from Hebrews 4.12 and 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 and from 2 Timothy 2.15 because if I want to have an intimate relationship with God and he's writing me a letter and I don't study it and I don't I put it aside or I take that card that I just wrote to my wife and she took it crumpled it up and threw it aside or let dust collect on it how would I feel about that it would just crush me but can we trust God's word from Hebrews? The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. Second Timothy, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Second Timothy, again, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We can study God's word and trust it. And maybe we're not as sharp as the person sitting beside us, but everybody, every Christian is filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you're in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach your spirit doctrine. As believers, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. As believers, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Second Corinthians, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Um, I've typed up my notes this time. So I have these scriptures all in here as references. And I'll send that to Joanne and she can distribute it. And you guys can have my notes too, if you'd like. <laughs> When you sin, you're out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't abandon you. This may be something that you've done or said or thought against God or against someone else, but we know all <coughs> sins are directed against God. So confess your sin and move on. And that's what we talk about when we say, don't be carnal. Don't live in the flesh. Live in the Spirit and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, Paul's letter, which was about 49 A.D., but the fruit of the Spirit, how do we know if we're in fellowship? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do you see this evidenced in your life? 
If you don't, these are things to work on and pray about. Because this is God's word, we know that Paul's personal letter to the Thessalonians is the same. At the same time, God's word to us. Our study of Thessalonians is relevant today. Our study of Kings will be relevant tomorrow. The study of God's word is always relevant. So we're finishing up first and second Thessalonians. And I just wanted to use that opportunity to give a little bit of a pitch about our personal study guides. They're designed the same way, explore the Bible. And uh, I'm gonna go back to, I'm skipping a little bit, but this material is put together by LifeWay adults. And you can go to goexplorethebible.com. It's actually, the URL is on the bottom of the page over here. And what I didn't know about it, but I discovered is that LifeWay is actually LifeWay Christian Resources. And it's the publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. So that gives me an assurance that the study material that I'm going to is study material that I can trust. What's also interesting about it is I noticed that there's a little CSB up here. I didn't know what CSB stood for and it stands for the christian study bible that was released in 2017 that was sponsored by the southern baptist convention and there's a whole history of how it got developed so you could go take a look at that if you'd like to um, in the guide there are some conventions to know and um, one is that the at the very beginning of it has word wise it's going to be really important for our next session when we get into Kings to take a look at the word wise because there's some personalities there that you might be too familiar with if you haven't been in Kings. It's, it's kind of a tough read. Um, there are some words for the study of Thessalonians that I wanted to bring out and remind you about it. I'll say the word, think about it a minute, and then I'll give you the definition, but apostasy. What does apostasy mean in the context of Thessalonians? Well, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, apostasy would precede the day of the Lord. This would be the spiritual infidelity and even political uprising that we'll see in the world. Archangel was another word on that list. And in the context of our study, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 said, the voice of the archangel will accompany Christ's return. And then, of course, Christ's return, the day of the Lord. The day of Christ's final victory, 1 Thessalonians 5.2. The term carries the idea of judgment, but also serves as an assurance of his blessings to us as believers. He's promised to come take us, to take us home. And then the sad reality of the man of lawlessness, according to 2 Thessalonians 2.3 through 4 and 9 through 12, the man of lawlessness is the ultimate opponent of Christ who will actively try to draw people away from following God and make them his followers. Many scholars equate him with the Antichrist, spoken of in 1 John 2.18. And I added some more scriptures uh, for reference when I send that out. But one of the references comes from Dan 9.27 from the Old Testament and Matthew 24.15. And then, of course, uh, Revelation. Regarding this man, uh, 1 John 2.18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but it, um, in this book, they have a Bible study plan. And it's, it's over 90 days of scripture reading that coincides the three months that will be in the book. So as we go to Kings, you'll have each day there's a reading that you're supposed to be doing. Um, There's outlines, and the outlines don't necessarily coincide the sessions in the book. Um, the outlines have the themes that you're to think about when you're studying the book of Thessalonians, and you'll use that. And I want to call some attention to some of the outlines. And then each week, there's a theme for that week, and I want to call attention to some of that for my notes. So in the outlines, he does his commendation to the Thessalonians, how they conduct themselves in ministry his personal concern, and then the call to sanctification. And in 2 Thessalonians, you also have the introduction, and then his injunction, which is the restraints on our community of believers, how we're supposed to conduct ourselves, and his con conclusion. But in the 13 separate chapters, 
there were different words that were highlighted in each chapter. So if we were doing a little bit of a review of what we'd studied so far, you'd see that the first chapter was commended. Transformed lives impact the other sake of the gospel, for the gospel. And Paul is commending the Thessalonians for that. Share his encouragement to boldly share compassion and grace. Confrontation. Confronting a person's response to the gospel defines his or her future. That can be a good confrontation or a bad confrontation, but we'll come up against God's word. And each one of these themes are going to be at the beginning of each session that you have. It'll say promised, and it'll have a little note about it. Promise, the promise of the return of Christ gives believers hope when, when grieving. Two more that I'm going to pull out. Uh, living. Salvation is demonstrated through God honoring lives. What's the scripture that reinforces that? 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever so follows his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also walk, just as he walked. That seems like a very strong encouragement of how we conduct ourselves. Session 13, which is today, ends in 2 Thessalonians 3. And I read to you, finally, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified, just as it was also with you, and that we will be rescued from troublesome, evil people. <laughs> We that we will be rescued. <laughs> no worries at all. But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord concerning you, that you are doing and will do what we command. You hear this personal pronoun, we, because Silas and Timothy are writing with Paul, through Paul. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the perseverance of Christ. Now we command you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother or sister who leads a disorderly life and not one in accordance with the tradition which you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a role model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. Now we command and exhort such persons in the Lord Jesus Christ to work peacefully and eat their own bread. But as for you, brothers and sisters, do not grow weary of doing God's good. If anyone does not obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of that person so as not to associate with him, so that he will be put to shame. And yet... Do not regard that person as an enemy, but admonish one another as brother and sister. Now may the Lord of peace himself continually grant you peace in every circumstance. The Lord will be with you all. I, Paul, write this letter with my own hand, and this is a distinguishing mark in every letter. This is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Tough words from Paul in ending and conclusion. But be careful with that. He's not calling them to be cruel. Paul told the church to not consider the believer living outside of God's will to be their enemy. 
what Paul says later to the church is Ephesus is apropos. And this is 10 years later, he's writing the church to Ephesus and he reminds them, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. That's Ephesians 6, 12. And when you come up uh, to people in your neighborhood or to others, have confidence that, that they have no right to turn their backs on God. They don't have any excuse for that at all. Romans 1.20 gives you that assurance. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what is made, so that they are without excuse. Yeah. Let me repeat. God's invisible attributes, his power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived. God's power and his nature. If a person starts to argue with you about God's power and God's nature, pray for them. Pray for their heart to change and to open up to some sense that the Holy Spirit will convict them. You know, we're required to give a true testimony to who Christ is in our life. Yes, sir. So whenever I come across a situation like that, and we all do because we live in the world, right? I always ask myself, well, what's, what's our responsibility in all this? And I look here and Vicky say things like, you know what, we need to love those people. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. The greatest commandment to check all the law of Christ is to love God and to love your neighbor. Now, Jesus had been teaching, um, he'd been healing people. And then uh, after a while, he, he drew the, the disciples up to the side of the hill somewhere, and he, and he delivered what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Talk about the attitude. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Then, as he continued to teach them, he said, you, talk to the disciples, you are the light of the world. A city that set on hills cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before them, so they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So some encouragement that comes out of that is that our responsibility is to be the light in this world. And that light should include a whole lot of God's love. I, I couldn't agree more. I just... Um... The excitement that Maria and I have in the morning when we get up to come to church, we love to worship God. We love to have community with God. But it's the, the love that we have in this classroom and our friends and our encouragement, the hugs that we get from Yvette and Judy and Roy and, and the people in this church, that's the love of God. And Christ is saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might, and love your neighbor as, as, as yourself. I mean, those are the commands. Love your neighbor wasn't somebody that was like you necessarily. It was somebody that was outside of our community. They weren't already adopted. Be salt, be light. And, and Paul's uh, encouragement to be faithful and live that life as a Christian in community. Do what is right, work towards that. I think a lot of that comes with maturity in your walk with Christ. You know, it's a lot easier. You, you just you come to church here to see the saints who have been living this for years. and emulate how do they handle that situation if you're still getting fired up about it after well how do you how do you know Hank's a Christian or Christianity is right for me do you ever hear anyone say well it's by this doctrine yeah, I mean if, if if my love didn't match up to that um I would have nothing if my love did not match up to that um it would be it would be worthless does scripture tell us that yeah. yes it says they'll know we are Christians by what? Romans 8. By our love. Your love. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says in James. I was laughing in the study guide that at the very beginning of it, in the preface, in the preface it said, but for all of Paul's great advice, you should focus on your personal relationship with Christ. And the reason why I laughed at that a little 
that it is, but for all of Paul's great advice, this wasn't Paul's just advice. <laughs> this is scripture. It's holy inspired word of God. Right. It's a holy inspired word of God. But what does God say about priorities? What does he say about priorities of whether I have the gift of tongues or prophecy of that nature? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. To your point, if I have a gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have all faith as so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and I surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity today. I love uh, studying God's word and sharing God's word with you and being encouraged by you. I encourage you this week to take that love and share it with others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.